heard from Bob last week at uh, Sunday School classes. A number of announcements throughout the bulletin. I hope you take them home and either put them on the refrigerator or share them with a friend. Adopt the Highway Cleanup is on Tuesday, and your help is needed to make that work go a little faster. Just uh, wear old clothes, good boots, and bring gloves. The community dinner, uh, you'll hear more about from Debbie, but we will be needing extra help this week. Touching the little lives, the tree is out in the assembly room, and you'll see how that is progressing as we gather gifts for the hospital. Are there other announcements this morning?
shows our willingness to forgive others and to be forgiven. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you.
baby Moses. We give thanks for the ways in which you remember us. Grace us, we pray, with faith, courage, imagination, and love shared by those women long ago. May your compassion lead us to see the needs and the suffering of the strangers in our midst. And may your presence fill us with the hope and the power to act for what is right on their behalf. In Jesus' name, amen. Our Old Testament lesson this morning comes from selected verses from Exodus chapters 1 and 2. And now that a new king rose over Egypt, who did not know Joseph, and he said to his people, Look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, that they will increase, and in a bit of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shepherd and the other Pura, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on their birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him, but if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God, and they did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? And the midwife said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt with them well with the midwives, and when the people multiplied, they became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. And then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every boy that is born to the Hebrews you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let the girls live. And after a long time, the king of Egypt died, and the Israelites groaned under their slavery and cried out. Out of their slavery, their cry for help rose up to God. God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God looked upon their Israelites, and God took notice of them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
were also there, looking on from a distance that they had followed Jesus from Galilee and had provided for him. Among the women were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. So Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out of rock. He then rolled a great stone to the door of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the tomb. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. Alert us, God, to the hope we have in you. You stay with us no matter what perils we face on our journeys through life. The gray skies are just clouds passing by. Grant us a brighter light. Open our hearts and minds today. Amen. Five women defied the Pharaoh because God had a plan for their lives. Five women, four with names, defied a Pharaoh, a man who goes without a name in our scripture, to show how God's power and providence saves people when there is no hope. Who were these five women? Well, two were midwives who helped deliver the Hebrew babies. Shipra, which means beautiful, and Hua, which means fragrant flower, were both open to God's plan for their lives. And they were not alone. Moses' mother, Jochebed, had to give up her son and risk trusting God. Imagine a mother giving away her son rather than let a pharaoh kill him. And then there was Moses' sister Miriam, a woman who followed her mother's directions and became part of a plan to save Moses from being murdered. And finally, God had a plan for a fifth woman, the daughter of Pharaoh, who went every morning down to the river. Two midwives, a mother, a sister, and a princess. Sounds like a wonderful story, and it is. This fall, winter, and spring, two women's groups will be studying stories of freedom from bondage about people on a journey from meaninglessness to a holy calling. And you can join these groups of Presbyterian women on the fourth Tuesday of each month, Bible, Food, and Fellowship. The Bible study book is available out in the assembly room and also in the church office for $8 a copy. If you can't be in one of the food, fellowship, and fun groups, simply buy a copy and read it at home. In the study, Janice Catron, who wrote it, is a Presbyterian pastor from Louisville, and she asks the basic question which many of us ask in our own lives. Is anybody there? Is anybody there? In infancy, we laugh as a child and a parent play peekaboo together, and as we go, Peekaboo! We remember how much fun that is because for a moment the child actually thinks that we disappear. Of course, some parents wish their children would disappear. <laughs> but playing peekaboo is really asking the question is, is anybody there? And then getting that immediate answer. Now, as we grow up, we have another dilemma. You, as parents or as grandparents, did what I did. You were supposed to pick up your kids at a certain time and Sometimes you would forget, and then our kids would languish, they forgot me again. <laughs> and then, as an adult, we ask the question, does anybody care how I'm feeling? Because as adults, we all like to hide our feelings. But in our scripture this morning, all three of those laments are answered in different ways. The first one, is anybody there? We hear that God has a plan for all of our lives. Even when we think God is invisible, the plan continues. They forgot me. But God says, I will never forget you. I will never forsake you. God will not let us down. God will not leave us. And when we ask the question, does anybody care how I'm feeling? God has drawn 
what would almost appear to be a map of our lives, all the significant moments, all of the joys and sorrows mixed in. And looking back, we can see how every single one of those events helped shape who we are today. Now, the Presbyterian Women's Bible Study gives some helpful historical background to our story. And in case you didn't remember from your early Sunday school training, 2013 does happen to be the 3,200th anniversary of the end of the 66-year reign of Ramses II. But you already knew that, right? Now, Ramses, if it was Ramses, and remember it's nameless in our scriptures, if it was Ramses, he had changed his mind about the Hebrews. At first they were seen as talented, and we have that story of Joseph at the end of the book of Genesis. And Joseph is well used and rises to power until he is in charge only second to the Pharaoh himself. But Ramses II changes his mind and decides that foreigners become a threat, especially because so many of them had been born. And so he demands a quota for each of them of making 2,000 bricks per day. There's an ancient uh, leather papyrus in the Museum of the Louvre. And we read about the demands that the pharaohs put on the Hebrew slaves. How many of you have ever done piecework? Not too many. Some of you know what that is, where you get judged by every piece of product that you produce, and if you produce too few, you are penalized, and if you have more, you get a prize. But imagine making 2,000 bricks every day for each person, brick after brick. And it was a process, so one person had to depend upon the next as the straw was gathered, as the forms were made, as they were dried, as they were taken out of the molds, and then as they were put into some building. Depending on somebody else for your very livelihood. But these five women defied the rules, the laws, the expectations, and the reality of their situations. Moses and Aaron had been born into this priestly family, and yet now they were slaves. <coughs> Miriam, as a woman, was useful for her household labor and her work in the field. That's why the women babies were spared. And yet, Miriam became a cruel <coughs> conspirator to save her brother. Jacobin was an ingenious Jewish, Jewish mother when she made a basket of reeds, reeds and left it in just the right spot where she knew the Pharaoh's family would come down and gather water every morning. And the princess, she was simply following a routine schedule, what we would call ordinary time in our church year. And she too defied authority in order to save a life. All of these lives intertwined like the amazing fabrics in a large quilt to design a story from God, a story of liberation and rescue. The princess even got her father to forgive her blatant act of defiance and to accept a foreign child into her own household. The child was restored to his mother, only now his safety was guaranteed. And what's more, the mother would be paid to nurse and raise her own child. What a wonderful plan God has to twist the parts of life together for our benefit, even before we realize what's happening. But how have we, as a nation, followed in the Pharaoh's footsteps? For we have changed the role of foreigners in our land from being equals to help build a nation and instead have subjugated them into an inferior and socially unacceptable role? How have we historically made the role of women one of lesser importance than men, paying women less than men for equal work? Has the church supported those who have defied the laws of this land with faithful, peaceful acts of civil disobedience, as with the laws on abortion? How have we treated those who accepted God's call to be God's rebels? Today, we are confronted in America with the reality of 11.1 million illegal immigrants, if we can call them that. And we are confronted internationally by 2 million refugees leaving Syria for the surrounding countries of Jordan and Iran. How do we handle issues that come out of our scriptures yet we live in today? 
Lee Porter is the fabric artist who created the quilts, one for each of the nine studies of the Presbyterian Women's Bible Study. For 10 years, she worked in Christ House. Christ House is the only 24-hour medical care homeless facility for men in all of Washington, D.C. She was guided by scriptures to go there, first from Psalm 137. By the waters of Babylon we sat down and cried. We hung up our harps on the willow trees. How could we have songs of Zion in a strange land? She treated the homeless men as though they were exiles, away from their own homes, which they were, and briefly in exile to this Christ house. She also saw the words of Jeremiah as ones that intertwined and made a fabric of her life with these homeless men. From Jeremiah 29, and we'll hear more about this next month when I preach another sermon. To preach on Jeremiah's advice, to build houses, plant gardens, have sons and daughters, to seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find welfare for yourself. Lee did that with her service at the shelter. And then she felt God calling her to another job, as God calls us to several in our lives. In the early 1970s, Lee Porter had a brain-damaged son and was very tied to her home because the boy had many problems, including seizures. But she writes us this message. I had always liked fabric, although I wasn't a very skilled sewer. I had made my two daughters, who were older than John, simple A-line dresses. Remember those? In interesting fabrics. I wanted to have a creative outlet which could fit into a very unpredictable schedule. Without any instruction, I cut into large squares a variety of fabrics, sewed them together, put a batting in between the fabric layers of PC squares, and made a quilt. Now the unexpected people that showed up in her lives became the unexpected people on the quilts that she made for this Bible study. Beautiful people, fragrant flowers as we would call them, Shipra and Kuwa, the daughters, the mothers and the princesses that God sends to rescue those in distress. Each of these people in our story acted bravely, defied orders, and followed a higher law. How has God guided your family through the times of migrations? How far back in your own ancestry do you have to look to find those who first immigrated to this nation? <clears throat> One kind of justice says evil for evil, punish the wrongdoers, make them suffer. But these women show us a different side of justice, that forgiveness responds to evil with good by transforming it by willingly accepting suffering so as not to prolong evil, and by using suffering as a means of introducing a new good or restoring one that had been wrecked. Romans 5, verse 5, describes the action of these five women in a Christian way. The love of God poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit given to us through Jesus Christ. By not choosing evil or revenge, the actions of each of the women led to forgiveness, led to healing, and led to life for another person. With subtle strategy, the midwives tantalized, enraged, and outflanked, outwitted the macho ruler, the Hitler of ancient Egypt, who sought to liquidate an entire people. Their vocation was to bring to birth, and so they objected to the king's commands to kill. Almost anonymous, too long ignored, the powerless who used the power they had, we hailed them as the foster mothers of exodus and liberation. Since then, according to, since then, according to Acts 17.6, the disciples of Jesus have turned the world upside down. The Holy Spirit seems to find a place in the chaos of our lives for conflict and prefers that as a working environment for miracles. So God invites each one of us to live out our lives against suffering and adversity. God rescues us even when we don't deserve it. Even when you think of yourself as a basket case, God rescues you. 
even when our own families may abandon us. Let us pray. Caring God, as we remember the story of the baby Moses, grace us, we pray, with the faith, courage, defiance, imagination, and love shared by those women long ago. In Jesus' name.
therapist, James. Um, it was going well with her, I think. He has to say yes. Um, and also, uh, Gwen Jacobs uh, moved on Friday to Schoenberg Health Care up in New Philly, close to her caregiver there. Our prayers are uh, with the Lord to heal Donna Westfall as she has her knee replacement uh, tomorrow. And with Ed Lee, who has had several hospital visits and is now at uh, New Albany Gardens in New Albany. Rob Miller leaves for Japan for two years tomorrow. Um, if you would like him to pick up anything for you, simply email Rob. Mm -hmm. Is that fair to say? Yes. And we continue to give thanks to God as God's plan gradually unfolds to our doubting minds in Syria. Are there other prayer requests this morning? Stop. Yes, Colin. <laughs> They do it because you have inspired 
to be healers. And the blind get to restore, have their sight restored. The lame leap for joy. And each of us sing your praises. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of those who rescue us in times of car accidents. For those who come from the squad and medic rescue. For Teresa Sheets and all of her family. And for the worries that we have that are held because you know each of us by name. So we celebrate we celebrate birthdays, we celebrate anniversaries, we celebrate homecomings and high school reunions, we celebrate the gift of being able to worship here for those visitors who have come from afar, for the gifts of music for Bob Morrison and Alice Hoover, for those who have sung this morning. We do not have music in our hearts unless you put it there for us. And so when we celebrate a one-year birthday of a little baby, May we celebrate the anniversaries of our birth, of our baptisms, of your bringing us together in our mother's wombs and having a plan for our lives. For all of these gifts, we thank you in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray together, saying, Who art Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
And it might even erode the support structure they currently have as their families and friends see changes and aren't able to relate to them in the same ways that they always have. But she said, I can't when you want it for you, your children, and your children's children. You have to want it. If you aren't ready to change, you should leave now. No one left. Everyone raised their hand. They are in. In January, each family will be paired with two allies who will spend four to six hours a month in friendship and supportive relationship for the next 18 months. All through this fall and for that 18 months, those families will eat with us on the third Wednesday of the month. Please pray for these families as they embark on this journey. And we have very good news. Grace Church has agreed to do dinner the first Wednesday of each month, beginning in November. So Peshawton has a meal every Wednesday of the month, 52 weeks a year.
love of God, to live in love, bid hatred, greed, and injustice cease. For God's glory is all the light we need. Let all our cities shine forth peace. And the blessings of God Almighty make you music bearers to all the world. In Jesus' name.